beloved audience, it is a true pleasure for me to introduce to you our opening speaker, a true pleasure. She's a wordsmith and a scholar. Maria Hornbacker is an award-winning essayist, journalist, and the New York Times bestselling author of five books. Hornbacher's work has been published in 18 languages, and her writing across genres appears regularly in literary and journalistic publications around the world, most recently in AGNI, Gulf Coast, Fourth Genre, Diagram, Broad Street, and the Bellingham Review. Her sixth book, a work of long-form journalism, will be published in 2018, and her seventh, a collection of essays, is underway. She was recently honored with the Annie Dillard Award in Creative Nonfiction, Maria is an assistant professor at Rowan University. Tonight, reading Wally's Birds and other short stories, ladies and gentlemen, I happily give you Maria Hornbacher. Hey, I have the short stool. I got, I got up on the short stool. I'm ready to go. OK, so the actual title, Six Ways of Talking About Strength, a question, an instance, a fact, a brief lesson on snakes, and the story of Wally's bird. <clears throat> One, have you ever had the sense that you are about to crack, to break, to splinter into pieces and just fall apart? Have you ever felt like there is something broken in you, something fragile, a false line in yourself? And then the fault line starts to spread. Soon it becomes a fissure, and then the fissure starts spreading web-like until you are covered with cracks that keep expanding over your body and face, and the pressure from within is enormous, and you are only seconds away from shattering completely, sending the infinite pieces of yourself flying, leaving you with nothing but some random shards. What did you do? How did you relieve the pressure? Did you blow apart? Or not wanting to make a mess, not wanting to bother anyone with the ear-splitting sound of your shatter, did you instead implode? Well, there's a flaw in the logic, of course. You aren't made of glass. In fact, you are flesh, a body, solid, intact, and possessed of a voice. In fact, you are whole, already, now. No matter where you have been, what you have done, what has been done to you, no matter how convinced you are that there is a fault line, a fissure, no matter how inherently flawed and prone to disappearance or dissolve you may feel, I will argue with you and I will repeat myself, you are here. You have survived. You cannot deny that. And no one can tell you it isn't true. You have proof. You're alive. And having survived, you and I, we need to heal. And in the process of healing our bodies and our minds, we discover our voice. Often, it's trapped at the back of the throat, sometimes kept beneath the tongue, and reminded that we have a voice, have always had a voice. We test out the sound of it. Maybe we mumble a little. We mutter and whisper a while. Hesitantly, we start to speak in regular tones. Then, just to see what will happen, we shout, startling ourselves and clapping a hand over our mouths. Gathering strength, though, we drop our hands because we need to, because we can, because it's time, because we begin to say what we are here to say, and eventually, we sing. Two, here is an instance. In 1999, when Christy Furness was 26, she walked down the hall of the psych ward and stopped at the nursing station to take the fistful of meds handed to her by the harried nurse. She had no diagnosis yet, no idea what pills she was swallowing, and not a clue what was going on. What she did have was a question. She waited until the nurse finally looked up and asked her, what's the problem? Christy said politely, um, is this thing going to go away? The nurse hesitated. Christy watched as her face turned sweet, even kind, the type of expression that says, oh, you poor thing. After a long pause, she offered, well, it may get more manageable. Christy nodded slowly, taking this in. So, she said, you mean I'll get used to it. She continued, so when the doctors were like, oh, yay, we know what you have now. You have schizophrenia. I was like, oh, yay, well, fuck that. Five years ago, Christy got married. On her wedding night, as the crowded room of people blew kisses and kazoos, I thought of a comment I've heard more than once from parents whose kids are dealing with mental illness. The worst thing these parents often say is that their child will likely never marry. 
Why that would be a crisis and why indeed it's seen as proof of sanity, I'm not sure. But I can speak to this one myself. Not only can you get married with a mental illness, you can do it as many times as you want. <laughs> but Christy and her wife Ruth are the strongest, sanest, steadiest couple I know. On their wedding night, as they danced themselves silly, I started to laugh remembering an afternoon quite a few years ago when my old friend Trockman and I were sitting in my living room, each of us slumped on a couch, each buried in our sweatpants and pajamas, looking like the loons we used to become every winter when the days got dark. We looked out the window. We looked at each other. We looked into the fire. Trock heaved a giant sigh and gave a sort of wistful smile, as if imagining a romance, a beach scene, a crazy dream. He said, wouldn't stability be nice? And it is. Three, here is a fact. I am moody. That is my diagnosis. In truth, I've gone through so many diagnoses that I have come to regard them with a measure of skepticism. But nowadays, my chart is absolutely spot on. It states that I am nicotine dependent, that I experience periodic insomnia not otherwise specified, and that I have a mood problem. In short, I smoke, I drink way too much coffee, and no question about it, I'm moody as hell. Nowhere in my two-ton chart, however, will you find my profession, my community affiliations, my meditation cushion, my poems, my ability to make a proper pie crust, my failure to have ever once passed a math class, the fact that I don't have children, the fact that I procrastinate and mope, the fact that I mentor young people, the fact that I have two weird little dogs, the fact that I'd rather be hiking. And perhaps you would say that none of those are relevant to my chart, but they are vital to my mental health. They are central to the way I live and perceive who I am. They are the things I have gathered around myself to create a life, a future, a self. For years I believed with a curious fervor that I would never get better, always be broken, and probably wind up in a psych facility for life if I was not dead by 35. But having missed that deadline, how do I know what comes next? If I am not the sum of my symptoms, if I am more than the crazy lady I expected and was told I'd be, how do I know who I am, where I belong, which way to turn? <clears throat> we have plenty of words for sickness, for madness, for crazy, for nuts, but we lack a proper language for wellness, for healing, for health. We have no words for what healing look like, looks like, how it happens, what it is. We use these words like journey, but journey implies a starting point. It implies a setting out. We don't take journeys from beginning to end. We spiral and amble. We trip and get waylaid and lost and bored and pissed and quit and then begin again because that is the nature of journeys. They neither begin nor do they end. There is no map for this journey. No map for illness and no map toward health. There is not a well-worn path that just everyone walks. This is your path. You lead the way. Four. Here is what I found on the path. <clears throat> I was walking in the desert one morning when I found a snake spine and a snake skin not far apart. They were tiny things, not even things. The thin paper of the shed skin moved slightly with the occasional breeze. It looked like a ghost snake in motion, whispering over the red dirt road. I watched the snake skin a while till it whispered off into the sagebrush and out of sight. It was spring. And I quote, the lack of limbs does not impede the movement of snakes. They have developed several different modes of locomotion to deal with particular environments, unlike the gates of limbed animals, which form a continuum. Each mode of snake locomotion is discrete and distinct from the other's transitions between modes are abrupt. That's how snakes work with what they've got. They adapt to their snakeness. They fashion their own ways of getting where they want to go. Given one terrain, a snake will try lateral undulation, the flex of the body to left and then right, giving the appearance of waves through the snake from teeth to tail. If the terrain suddenly shifts, as terrain kind of tends to do, the snake changes approach. It sidewinds, skating across a sand dune or a mudflat, an open expanse with no irregularities to guide its turns. Here is a very brief lesson in snakes. When a snake is about to shed its skin, it knows it. It probably itches. In any case, the snake slithers to a rock. When it arrives, 
It begins to rub its nose up against the rock. It rubs and rubs. Eventually, the skin breaks, and the new tender nose shows through. The snake continues to rub its face and then its body against the rock until the old skin is loose enough that the snake can slither out. The process is painful. Snakes don't like it. But it's necessary for the snake to grow and continue on its way. And as we, like the snake, transform into our deeper, rawer, realer selves, our nerves on fire, lacking a tough, dull surface to protect us, the sun hot on our skin and earth rough on our belly, our beating heart is just visible beneath the new translucent skin. The poet Anne Stevenson wrote, when we belong to the world, we become what we are. We are ever transforming, ever becoming, always belonging, always new. Five, here's the story of Wally's bird. <clears throat> Wally is one of the guys in my writing group at the drop-in center. Wally is a brilliant painter, makes his living with his art, lives with his sister, and it must be admitted, spends a fair amount of time on his home planet. He can usually be found in the center's vast art studio or sketching at the corner table at the retro hipster glam doll donut shop. I have seen that, Wally writes, but I have never seen what he writes. In his tiny, dense hand, whether anyone else is writing or not, he looks up often and eagerly nodding, and though I have no idea what he's writing over there, he is the most reliable member of the writing group, arriving at 2 p.m. sharp on Fridays, usually a little paint spattered, carrying with him his stack of magazines, sketchbooks, books on art, loose sheets of paper, recipes, tarot cards, pamphlets, liner notes, the occasional unwieldy canvas and small pieces of wood. Wally is a collector of things, artifacts, and when they discover our lost civilization some millennia from now, they will find all the clues to our culture in Wally's stack. There are days when he can explain it, and days when the explanation is somewhat nonlinear, but why should he have to explain anyway? A man can carry a stack of stuff if he wants. So, Wally bustles into the room, trailing paper and smelling pleasantly of turpentine and acrylic paint, greets everyone and settles into his seat. This week, we are hashing out the contents of our new literary magazine, deciding what we want to cover and who wants to cover what. Sally, a hospice nurse, will be doing the events calendar. My old friend David, who is freakishly brilliant and deeply weird, is the obvious choice for poetry editor. Bob, who lives down the hall in my apartment building, will cover museums and art. Robert, a veteran, will cover street news. Dana will be fiction editor. Farouz will write a column on recovery strategies. And David says he'll deign to write a, few, a humor column if he's allowed to be grim and grotesque. We brainstorm memes for the magazine, discuss whether we want it printed on broadside or glossy, submission guidelines and deadlines, and throughout all of this, Wally scribbles and scribbles and rotates his page to get in a few more scribbles. And when Wally says, Wally, Sally says, Wally, what do you want to write? All eyes turn to Wally. Wally leans back in his chair, studies his sketchbook, and says thoughtfully, I think I'm going to do film and restaurant criticism from the point of view of a sparrow. He turns his sketchbook to show us. There on the page is a sparrow in a bowler hat, dropping donut crumbs from its beak and narrating a film review in very tiny script. I told a friend about this. She furrowed her brow and said, well, I guess he's at least like writing a film review, right? So that's like pretty functional, I guess. No, I said. The fact that the man makes a living as an artist is functional. The fact that he lives independently is functional. The fact that he is both more reliable and punctual than any of my students or colleagues is functional. The fact that he can see from the point of view of a sparrow, though, that is something else. To adapt to the world as it is, and yet see it newly each day. To expand the fixed boundaries of beauty. To take the bus. To live at home. To navigate the sometimes shifting terrain of reality. To carry your stack of papers because you might need them and because you feel like it. That is a way of being in the world and belonging to it. That is the way of becoming who you are.